So now we will move on next to Ms. Decca's paper, Psychoanalysis and Gaming. And she can take it away whenever she pleases. Thank you. The gaming industry has been scaling the upper rungs of market share in the world economy for a number of years now. Recent scandals like that of blizzards have made it clear that publicity and relevance has increased manifold. This scandal proved that the gaming industry has been influenced by and works closely with many pressure groups, political ideologies, economic institutions, and different national governments, and vice versa. Along with that, it is also important to note ethics from a structural viewpoint as statistics would show that the gender gap still exists in many forms and institutions. It is interesting to note that a few things have not changed for a very long time. The garments or clothes options available for a female character, for instance, and also the storylines of characters that are of gender or gender orientation other than males who are labeled cisgender and heterosexual. Maybe Assassin's Creed is one of the very few franchises that had made an early effort of inclusivity without making some uncanny plot lines and a forced idea of inclusivity that players have pointed out as problems in the recent game of the century, The Last of Us Part Two. I would like to inspect the storylines and attires of a few characters from a few games that are otherwise shrouded in normative cloaks and speculate upon the fact that sex, society, and psychology does or does not play a role in game development. And when I was growing up, I remember playing a few video games frequently. I remember distinctly liking their storyline of Project IGI, Wolfenstein, and Ghost Recon. I also recall playing Robin Hood, The Legend of Sherwood. The main characters were fully clothed, heavily armed, and I did not think much about the fact that most characters in those kind of games were men. And then I also came across games like those of the Lara Croft series, the Tomb Raider series. Many women found it extremely appealing to see an armed woman in adventurous action. The fact that such games made it possible for the players to choose the kind of garment that they wanted to see on the character, especially the woman, made such games even more alluring. While I was also taken in by the craze of such games, especially because I, I was amazed by the fact that there were games that revolved around strong women characters. And being a woman myself, it felt like a win-win situation to begin with. But then I thought of something else. National armies, navy, and air forces around the world recruit both men and women. They have uniforms and other dress codes that are uniform for all genders. Women in such forces wear the same kind of garments as the men. Women do not handle guns and ammunition in cropped vests and extremely short pants on the battlefield. So why is it always necessary for women characters in video games to be scantily clothed and anatomically constructed in such a way that it is appealing to the male gaze? And if female characters are highly sexualized through video games, why is the same courtesy not extended to male characters? While some critics may argue that video games mostly create worlds of fantasy, and that is why such exaggerated characterizations are required. It is imperative to note that this fantasy world is extremely unbalanced. A study conducted in the year 2011 by the International Game Developers Association showed that 73% of females in the industry are usually bestowed upon work roles and responsibilities that are outside the main arena of game development which further proves that their voices scarcely reach the real content, character representation research, interactive features, and reward systems that we witness in video games. Another study conducted in the year 2017 by IGDA 
on developer satisfaction survey showed that 75% of respondents were men, proving that nothing much had changed with regards to representations and needs of uh, entertainment in a time frame of six years. Due to such circumstances, it may not be incorrect to conclude that maybe most publishers and developers have either chosen to completely ignore this issue or to not want to address it consciously, thereby contributing to the continuing development of games that fulfill many fantasies and interests of the cis-heterosexual male figure in our world. Another study conducted by the IGDA portrayed that in the year 2014, 76% of game developers in United States were men, 22% were women, and another 2% belonged to the transgender or androgynous or other category. In the year 2019, 71% of game, game developers were men, 24% women, while only 5% belonged to the transgender androgynous other category. We say that we live in a postmodern world and yet gender equality is a far-fetched dream. When such biased situations come across our eyes, could we deny the effects of psychology in the popular video games that exist today? Man is inherently a creature of language, which gives him the ability to weave narratives. Many factors like family ideologies, personal beliefs, Political affiliations and other socioeconomic instruments play a major role in the development of a person's consciousness, subconscious, and even the unconscious. The analytic process can be identified primarily as an unfolding of language, which is prior to and beyond all unification, distanciation, and objectification. Language here resonates between two subjects, posed or deposed, as Julia Kristeva points out. It opens or closes their bodies to its implicit ideals and offers a possibility, not without risks, of a psychic as well as a physical life. Game developers use the means of language not only to represent characters but also weave storylines. Their creations become their language which reflect their states of mind. Furthermore, it is not simply the issue of character and gender representation that is biased, but also the narratives or storylines of games. In the recent times, we have witnessed problems of representation and narration concerning characters that are identified as having sexualities not conforming to the traditional heteronormative gender and sexuality paradigm especially in the game The Last of Us Part Two, The main reason behind these problems is that such video games use the storyline as a pivotal point throughout, thereby making the sole act of storytelling vital to the success of games. It's common knowledge that developers of digital fiction depend on rich virtual worlds to make their stories engaging. It's common nature also to think that we have created or found a good story when we cannot deny it our attentive focus and we want to find out how the story ends. Sometimes a good story also makes us want to revisit it so as to ensure that we did not miss anything important the first time, thereby playing to the mind's pleasure of knowing and unknowing. The feeling that there may be something more that is hidden in the story in the video game world is nothing but an illusion of choice that is supposed to make the players feel like they are actual participants in the narrative of the game in its entirety. And yet in The Last of Us Part 2, we witness a lot of violence, emotional turmoil, pain and suffering which is mostly inflicted on the queer characters. If video games are indeed supposed to be worlds of fantasy, such characters must also have a stake at having a proper narrative, like many other heterosexual characters in video games. The Last of Us Part Two is a kind of an open world game, but the player is not given any in-game choices in the narrative progression, thereby taking away not only the agency of the players, 
but also the agency of the represented characters and thereby represented communities. It is bound by predetermined structures of authority. It's important for us to understand that proper representation in games can only be derived if people with lived experiences are hired more often. It is only by creating a culture removed from microaggressions that proper representation can be achieved. If there is proper representation behind the computer and the camera, there would be authentic nuanced diversified representation on screen. Thoughts of indifference with regard to the hiring process of the workforce of the gaming industry needs to be done away with because indifference can be blinding. While this may seem like an attempt at inclusivity, the reality is quite different. The Last of Us Part 2 tactfully avoids using labels like lesbian and transgender and tries to make up for it with some homophobic slurs later on in the game. The roots of these problems extend much beyond the video games themselves. It can be traced back to the platforms that continue to wage war against queer politics, sexuality, and also feminism. Just a handful of big, wealthy tech companies and game platforms have control over the entire gaming economy and its ideologies. There have been instances of Tumblr banning female presenting nipples, TikTok and Instagram's tactical shadow ban of queer creators, and Twitch banning indie games that showcase intimacy and sexuality. It is such systemic problems that contribute to the mainstream ideologies of improper inclusivity or none at all. The kind of tactful policing that slowly kills the future. Video games inherently use different media in order to create expressive language, and language can be a powerful instrument in and of itself. When a storyteller combines their words with fascinating computer graphics, a new world takes shape in front of our eyes, and we as players use the mouse and keyboard or other interactive hardware in order to traverse through that world. While it may seem that such worlds, especially open world video games, are seemingly vast, it is surrounded by event horizons that are results of mathematics and coding. So a good story in a video game would have to make up for this shortcoming by giving the players a good narrative with nuanced characters. It is a known fact that the analytic experience dredges up the libido buried under seemingly humble or pure desires and aspirations. Repressed sexuality turns out to be the point of interchange between, on the one hand, biological energy and its neurological traces what scientists call the neuronal map. And on the other hand, psychic inscriptions and representations. The erogenous zones are especially sensitive, particularly in human beings, which probably accounts for the central role of the sexual function in psychic life and its function as intermediary between the neuronal map and meaningful representation. The biased statistics that the world has seen in the gaming world with regard to developers, video game character representations, and narrative structures only further proves the fact that psychology and sexual psychology is deeply rooted in the development of a game. While there may be some video games that give more room to play over story, we cannot deny the fact that games reflect the cultural renditions and forms of the present times in different ways. Most game developers try to balance the literary and the ludic, often at the cost of poorly nuanced characters and narratives. While some games like those of Red Dead Redemption and Horizon Zero Dawn focus on the importance of setting, themes, dialogues and characters, and technology has also come a long way since the 1970s, developers are yet to capture the hallmarks of reality and good literature in digital form. 
Human language is the only known code of communication through which both the signifier and the signified could be doubly articulated, thereby more of diversity and inclusion in the real gaming world, the better. Studies have shown that people who do not identify themselves as cisgender males in the male-dominated gaming industry have faced discrimination in various ways. In order to tackle such gender stereotypes, we need to recognize the psychology that is at work behind such developments. While there may be many independent developers out there, but they are mostly pushed to the margins of the gaming world, they are never, quote, mainstream. When video games are seen to have characters, mostly not male ones, who serve as background decoration, and their sexuality and victimhood are exploited in order to infuse racy or edgy flavors in the fantasy world, the gaming world needs to recognize that their infamous reputation of being a quote, boys only club needs to be scrutinized. The lack of women, for instance, in creative roles result directly in games failing to be more inclusive. While developers and big companies may argue that they might lose their mostly male fan base, they fail to see the other side of the equation, which is, Along with proper inclusivity and properly researched narrative structures, they would have a fan base that would encompass different groups of society. Thank you.